after Easter, we'll be here again in uh, Pittsburgh. And the epistle for this fourth Sunday after Easter is taken from that of St. James, chapter 1. Beloved, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no change nor shadow of alteration. Of his own will he has begotten us by the word of truth, that we might be, as it were, the first fruits of his creatures. You know this, my beloved brethren, but that every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. For the wrath of man does not work the justice of God. Therefore, casting aside all uncleanness and abundance of malice, with meekness receive the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. And the Gospel. Then they go to St. John chapter 16. At that time, Jesus said to his disciples, I am going to him who sent me, and no one of you asked me, Where art thou going? Because I have spoken to you these things, sorrow hath filled your heart. But I speak the truth to you, it is expedient for you that I go. For if I do not go, the Advocate will not come to you. But if I go, he, I will send him to you. And when he has come, when he, ha when, when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of justice and of judgment. Of sin, because they do not believe in me. Of justice, because I go to the Father, and you shall see me no more. And of judgment, because the prince of this world has already been judged. Many things yet I have to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. But when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will teach you all the truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but however he will hear, he will speak. And the things that are to come, he will declare to you. He will glorify me because he will receive of what is mine and declare it to you. Those are the words of today's Holy God. In this fourth Sunday after Easter, a few considerations on this mystery of a little while. And our Lord says, I am saying to you that I go. We'll do a second consideration on this as the earlier sermon today, the dear second one. At that time, Jesus said to his disciples, I am going to him who sent me, and no one of you asked me, where art thou going? Because, But because I have spoken to you these things, sorrow has filled your heart. But I speak the truth to you, it is expedient for you that I go. No one asks where our Lord is going on that Holy Thursday night. And even during these days of the 40 days between uh, Easter Sunday and Ascension Thursday, our Lord is preparing his apostles for a difficult departure. He's going to depart. And he's saying to his apostles, you're very happy to be with me on this Holy Thursday night. Very similar to the joy of the three apostles, St. Peter, James, and John. who had great joy when they were on the mountain of, God, of, of the Transfiguration, and they heard Moses speak, and they heard Elias speak, and they heard Christ speak, and they saw him transfigured in his most beautiful glory. And they saw that beautiful transfiguration. But that transfiguration would be a consolation they would receive, which would not benefit them, because that consolation was to get them through the crucifixion. That consolation was to get them through particularly the three hours of the agony in the garden. And when those three hours came, they were to remember how Elias and Moses spoke with Christ about the crucifixion. They spoke to Christ about his suffering. And that this God who was transfigured before them not too long ago was now suffering a bloody sweat. And it was the same one. And they would remember the transfigured Christ and now the bloody Christ. And they were to meditate and contemplate and comfort Christ during those three hours. They did not comfort him. Now that consolation was wasted for those three apostles. But now a consolation comes on the Holy Thursday. And this consolation shall not be wasted. And it's interesting because the consolation of the transfiguration, that consolation was a beautiful consolation given to the apostles. And what do they say? It is good for us to be here. I said, no, it's not good for you to be here. It's a beautiful thing that you see me in this transfigured state, but I'm gonna, what about those nine apostles that are your friends? Are you going to leave them at the bottom of the hill and forget about them? What about the work of bringing my soul and my teaching and my faith and my life and my everything and my word to all mankind? Is it just good for you three to be here on top of a mountain? That's one reason why I've always been disturbed a bit 
by the spirit of those who say, we must go out in the wilderness because hard times are coming. The only people we know of that went out in the wilderness and hard times are coming were the, uh, the, the fathers of the deserts. They went into the wilderness, but what did they go into the wilderness to do for harder times than the hard times that were coming? The fathers of the desert went out into the wilderness in order to spend a hundred years in penance and prayer and contemplation of God. They didn't go out in the wilderness to escape troubles. They went there to find God. And the troubles that they did want to escape were the troubles of sin and the troubles of vice. And the good they wanted to find was to spend their time alone with Christ. It is the most beautiful life, but a life that most of us cannot bear. That's why they went into the desert. Now we want to go into the desert because the cities are going to be attacked by all the viruses, attacked by all the armies, attacked by all the persecution, and we must flee the persecution. While it's okay to a certain extent to flee a persecution sometimes, this is not the purpose for going to the desert. What did the Catholics do in Rome? They were persecuted for 300 years. They had a list of Catholic cities, places to avoid. Rome, number one. Because in Rome, they are the leaders of the killers of the faith. Is that what they thought for 300 years? Did it get into their thick skulls? <laughs> Now let's do the math. We've had popes now for 200 years. 250 years. Now the first pope, he was martyred by the Romans. And the second pope, um, he was martyred by the Romans. And the third pope, uh, he was uh, martyred by the Romans. And the fourth pope, let's see what happened. He was martyred by the Romans. And the fifth pope, uh, he was martyred by the Romans. Time to move your home. <laughs> Doesn't mean it's time to think about a new place to live. <laughs> but then the sixth pope, well, he was martyred by the Romans. And the seventh pope, well, he was martyred by the Romans. And every single pope, of which there were so many popes in those first 200 years, first 300 years, they all had one thing in common. They were martyred by the Romans. But they never figured, maybe I should move out of Rome never crossed their minds. They shed their blood in the city of Rome, and even though they were martyred by the Romans, what did they do? They made Rome turn Catholic with their blood, and they shed their love in Rome. Why is that? Because the second consolation. There's a first consolation, which was the consolation of the transfiguration. And that first consolation was, it's good for us to be here, Lord. <clears throat> no. I gave you this great gift of seeing Elias, of seeing Moses, of seeing me in my glory, so that you might carry that in your heart while you're going into battle. What does a real man in war do? A real man in war, when he is fighting the enemy, and he is shedding blood, and he is out in the war, and he is experiencing wounds, and he is in a state of agony, what does he do? He pulls out a picture of his wife. And when he sees that beautiful person, and he sees that beautiful face, and he sees that wonderful being, what happens? You don't want to be the next guy to meet him in battle. You don't want to be the next guy at the bridge. Because when he sees that beauty, and when he sees that wonder, he receives strength. He receives power to do what? Kill more bad guys to fight longer, to persevere in the battle, to be stronger than he was before. And it has been discovered in real war, a man that has nothing to lose is worthless in battle, for he has nothing to gain either. But a man that has a great possession of a beautiful wife, and a great possession of a wonderful family, and a great possession of the true faith, and a great possession of the love of God, don't be his enemy in battle. He carries that with him, and he cannot be defeated. And so, what is it that we carry into battle? The first consolation was wasted, and now we have the second consolation. And Christ will not allow this consolation to be wasted. And this is the consolation. They must have been at the top of the mountain for three hours at the Transfiguration, speaking with Moses and Elias. And now we're during the three hours of that beautiful supper, 
in which Christ made his apostles bishops, and he gave them the first Holy Communion, and he gave them the great power of the priesthood, and he talked about his New Testament, and he spoke about what divine love is, and he spoke clearly about the truth, and they were filled with the greatest joy that they had ever had in their three and a half years with him. And then what does he do? Are you all very happy now? We were all very peaceful now. Now I've got some news for you. I'm going to the Father. I'm leaving. And I'm leaving very soon. And the joy of the apostles collapsed. And they were filled with a great sadness. And there's where we meet the verse in the gospel today. They were filled with a great sadness. He's leaving. We were so happy, everything was so wonderful, and then bang, he's leaving. And not is only leaving. He is going to leave with a bloody sweat. He's going to leave with a crown of thorns, a scourging. He's going to leave with six trials by which they condemn him to death. He's going to leave by the hand of one of his own apostles betraying him. He's going to leave with a mockery of Herod. He's going to leave with a death on the cross between two thieves. He's going to leave denied by all the people, saying his blood be upon us and upon our children. And he is going to be shed every drop of his blood until out comes blood and water. And then it's going to be Nicodemus, a Pharisee, and Joseph, a rich man of Arimathea, who will be the only ones to take care of his burial. He is leaving in a most violent and terrible way. And the desolation is going to be so great that it would destroy any soul. But our Lord will let these 11 men survive that terrible desolation. How did he get them through it? These three hours... He gave them priesthood. He gave them the Blessed Sacrament. He gave them an understanding. He strengthened their souls. And he said, you're sorrowful. You're already sorrowful and I haven't left yet. I just told you I'm leaving and you're so sorrowful. But that sorrow is going to be turned into joy. Don't worry about that. It is most necessary for you that I go. Now, why were they sorrowful? They were sorrowful because they wanted the wrong thing. They just wanted to be with Christ because the feeling that they had being with him and because of the confidence they had in his presence. But our Lord wanted them to have a greater confidence. I want you to carry me when you can't see me. I want you to speak like me when you can't hear me and see my, you can't see my body and you can't hear my voice and you don't know that I'm there. I want you to carry me where I am not. Can you carry me where I am not? St. Saint Louis, St. Francis de Sales would speak about it. God is love, he says. Deus caritas es. What do we carry to the world? We carry the truth that is explained to us by a paraclete. Our Lord says to those apostles, it is necessary for you 11 men, not for you 12. There's 12 in the room. Not all 12 were benefited by these words. One man had no idea what he was talking about. It went totally over his head. The others did not understand what he was talking about. Well, they understood like men of love understand. I don't understand the words you're saying. I don't understand what exactly you mean. But I know it's right. And I'm ready to die for it. And I want it to be in my heart. And I want to understand. And I will strive deeply to understand. But these words are so beautiful. They're so divine. They're so supernatural. They're so wonderful. That try as they might, with the best hearts that they have, they cannot understand. They shouldn't be disturbed. Because the mother of God, who was conceived immaculate, was the most beautiful creature God ever made, and who never had original sin, and never made a mistake in her life, what happened when Simeon said to the mother of God, Thy own soul a sword shall pierce. And what does the Holy Ghost tell us? And he is the spouse of the Blessed Virgin Mary. He knows her very well. She did not understand these words. And then 12 years later, Son, my son, why, we have sought thee sorrowing. Why hast thou done so to us? Thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. Do you not know it must be about my father's business? And what does the Holy Ghost say about his spouse, his most wonderful spouse? And she did not understand these words, but she pondered them in her heart. There are many, many words 
that God speaks to us that are beautiful and true, which shall never be understood until we ponder. And it don't, it's not that we don't understand them because of our sins. It's not that we don't understand them because of our foolishness and our weakness. If we don't understand because we are not divine. We don't understand because we don't have a mind quite as large as that of God. We don't have a heart as large as his heart. And so he's going to open up that mind and open up that heart. And that can't happen unless we ponder. The Holy Mother pondered the things. And then she had an understanding after she pondered, not before. And so we see these 11 apostles, they are sinners. They have made many mistakes. And they are sad. And they are sorrowful. And they don't understand but what's going to happen. Our Lord says, all right, I know you're sorrowful. I know you don't understand. There are many things that happen to us we don't understand. But I want you to ponder these things in your heart. And I'm going to go away. Because when I'm with you, I've got to hold your hand. And you have so much confidence in my hand. I want you to walk without my hand holding you. I want you to fulfill the word of St. Louis. I mean, St. Francis de Sales who said, Where there is not love, put love. And there you will find love. This is what the priest of God has to do. This is what the Catholic has to do. Go to places where there is not love. For love is, there is no love without the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. There is no love without the truth of the Father, without the sacrifice of the Son, without the breath of the Holy Ghost. There is no love. But where there is not love, place the Blessed Trinity. For there will always be three parts of love. Love is never a single part. It's always three in one. And it'll never be one in one. So I gave you a teaching. And you memorized it. I'm very proud of you. Well, you tried to learn. But now you must learn. And you cannot learn unless I go. And so I am going. And I am glad for you that I am going. And it's because of the love of you that I am going. Therefore, I am going to the Father. And I'm going to let you have sorrow. Because unless you have sorrow, the paraclete cannot come. Paraclete means the comforter, the consoler. But if we are not sorrowful, if we don't have troubles, how can we be consoled? So therefore, Christ allows us to have sorrows. And remember, what is that most beautiful of all women that ever were created by God, who never did anything wrong, what do we call her? She is called the mother of sorrows. And her sorrows caused her that loved most wonderfully to love more wonderfully. Who understood perfectly to understand more perfectly. And that she was able to grow who was began perfect and she became more perfect. She began beautiful became more beautiful. And what made her change from being most beautiful to even being more beautiful? It was the mother of sorrows. Sorrows helped her to be consoled by her spouse, the Holy Ghost. Sorrows helped her grow in the love that she already had that was perfect. And the sorrows helped the perfect mother. One of the great challenges we have and mistakes we make in the supernatural life, all of us, is that I want to have life without sorrow. And the reason why, the reason why I had a bad life is because of my sins. Think of it like this. You know, the reason why you didn't give me that second Coca-Cola that was flat and I had I had a second Coca-Cola that was flat and it was not cold is because I murdered your mother. <laughs> That's why you did that. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> well, when you murder someone's mother, you normally get your head chopped off, put in an electric chair and fried slowly or skinned alive or some other thing like that. <laughs> when you get a second Coca-Cola from the man whose mother you murdered and it's a little bit flat, there must be some other reason. And this is the way we speak to our Lord. Lord, the reason why I suffer, the reason why I have so many difficulties, reasonable challenges is because of all my terrible sins. It's what I deserve for my sins. No, that's not what you deserve for your sins. What you deserve for your sins is a hell worse than hell. You deserve more suffering than Lucifer gets. You deserve more suffering than all the damned have right now. That's what you deserve for your sins. That's not why he lets us suffer. He lets us suffer to teach us his love. He lets us suffer to try to open our hearts, to understand what he is about. And therefore, those 11 apostles, 
they would make mistakes. One would be a coward three times. The other would be a coward once. They would all run away from him. But what's going to happen? He's going to see them again on the third day. And now he's going to instruct them during the last 40 days. Now, my children, go out and carry me to the ends of the earth. You will be the 12 pillars, not Judas. He'll be replaced by Matthias. But you will, you, will be, you will be the 12 pillars that will go out to the ends of the earth. And you must continue the passing on of that divine love and that divine truth must be passed on to every generation, including ours in 2020. We must carry in living flesh the divine love in our age. We must carry the divine truth in our age. And don't worry that we are not worthy. No man that carries Christ can ever carry him. Remember the mistake that Christopher made. Little boy, I've carried many big men across this sea, across this rock, across this river, but you are heavier than all the rest of them combined. What are you doing? Who are you, little boy? I am Jesus Christ, and I carry the weight of the sins of the world. And you, Christopher, you do not carry me across the waves. I carry you. And he switched from a dumb giant into a great saint. It's Christ that carries us across the waves. And so here we are in this consideration. I am so You are sorrowful because I am getting ready to go. It's for you that I go. And I'm going to teach you what love is. And I'm going to teach you how to carry my faith. Because it must be instilled in you. And because that paraclete is going to come and it's going to teach you all truth. When you learn every word in the catechism. And know every word in the Bible. You don't know all truth. You know the skeleton of it. You know a little bit of the words, but you do not know all truth. In order to know all truth, these words, this divine truth, it must penetrate your heart and you must be comforted with it. There must be a warm breeze that comes into a cold heart and changes these words into life. For the words of God are not dead words. They are not empty words. They are only alive. They are only powerful when they are alive. That is all truth. Truth that is not alive is not all truth. And therefore Christ says to 11 of those men, not 12 of them, not Judas, the paraclete will come. Judas will have already committed suicide and be in hell. But the paraclete will come to you 11. And Matthias who shall take the place of Judas. And the paraclete will come to the 12 of you. And he will give you, teach you all truth. And then you will carry that truth to the whole world. And you're going to convict the world of sin, of justice, and of judgment. Here's what the church does the last 2,000 years. The priests and bishops of the church. We are supposed to go through this, this world and convict it. The paraclete is a dove. He does not have a human mouth. He does not have a human tongue. He does not speak. And yet, the only way to convict is with a human tongue. Therefore, what does the paraclete do? He enters into the heart of the apostle. He enters into the heart of the priest. He enters into the part of the clergy of the church when they are obeying and following his words. Not every priest. No, not every priest. That's why Christ says in the sacred scripture, wherever I am, my minister shall also be. He does not say, whoever my minister is, there I am, because there are many, many places where the minister of Christ is, but Christ is not there. There are ministers of Christ in the Noble Soto churches. There are ministers of Christ all over the world. There are ministers of Christ in the dioceses. There's a minister of Christ in Rome, and Christ is not there. But wherever Christ is, his minister shall come. Therefore, sometimes the minister of Christ is not representing Christ. And sometimes the minister of Christ is. When is he representing Christ? When he is filled with the paraclete, when the consoler is entered into him, when he is able to convict the world of sin, of justice, and of judgment. He convicts the world of sin because they have not believed in me. Whenever we meet Christ, we are sinners who don't believe in him, and therefore they must be baptized. Therefore they must go to confession. Therefore they must turn away from their life of sin and make a perfect act of contrition. They have to enter into the life of grace and exit the life of sin. 
Therefore, the first time we meet the priest, his duty is to convict us of sin. And the second is to convict us of justice. For even when we have left behind the essential original sin and received the Holy Catholic faith and are not necessarily committing mortal sins all the time, we must be convicted of justice because I go to the Father. That is, do not make the mistake of making heaven on earth. It's a great temptation to try to make heaven on earth. We want heaven to be a place on earth. No. Heaven is not a place on earth. Heaven is a place in heaven. It's so much better than the life here on earth. Don't try to make heaven on earth. But be convicted of justice. Let justice be inside of your hearts. Let the divine truth and divine grace be inside of your hearts. And let that divine truth and divine grace cause us to be able to climb to God. That's what has to happen. Of sin and of justice and finally of judgment because the prince of this world is already judged. The prince of this world is already judged. So what does that mean? There will come a time of judgment. That time of judgment came in the life of St. Teresa of Avila when the God, the, our Lord Jesus Christ came to her and gave her a ring, the ring of spiritual marriage, where she had climbed to the top of the seven castles and she was so filled with the divine love that the devil was gone from her completely and she was confirmed in grace. When the apostles on Pentecost, walked out. They received the divine grace. They were filled with the divine grace. So the devil could never have power over them ever again. And the devil was judged. And they were saints that carried Christ to the ending of the earth. For the devil was convicted of sin, of justice, and of judgment. And the judgment takes place where the, the hell, where the devil is in the prince of this world, and the devil is put in the very depths of hell and no longer with us. Hence, these are three stages of the supernatural life. Firstly, let us leave behind sin. Secondly, let us acquire true justice. And thirdly, that there be a judgment upon the damned, a judgment upon sin inside of our lives, and it's completely gone. And these can be called the three spiritual ways of the purgative, the illuminative, and the unitive way of the spiritual life. But then there's the other side, by which the priest is supposed to convict the world of sin, of justice, and of judgment. Of sin because they do not believe in me. And those who do not believe in Christ, and those who have not the truth, they shall be convicted of sin. But if they do not turn to Christ and turn away from sin, they shall experience justice. And justice means whatever good is in them is going to be taken away. Our Lord said that, that he who hath not, that which he has, it shall be taken from him. This is happening right now in our world today. Souls have turned away from God. They want money. They want security. They want a life of sin. They want joy. They want happiness. They want natural happiness. They want heaven on earth. And they want it without God. Well, now justice has come. You will not have it. That which you have shall be taken from you. you got confidence in your credit cards, your bank accounts. It's going to be taken from you. You got confidence in all this false freedom you have, it's going to be taken from you. You got confidence in all these Bilderbergers and these wicked men. You got confidence in doctors and scientists who are killing us now. The doctors and the scientists. We don't follow the priests anymore. We don't follow Christ anymore. We don't follow the church anymore. We believe in doctors and scientists. And we believe in economists. The economists are destroying our economy. The doctors are destroying our health. And the scientists are killing everything. And why is that? Because we are experiencing justice. We have left behind the divine justice, and so let the justice of the devil take over, and we will be completely destroyed. And finally, those who go not to God shall be experiencing judgment. They shall be experiencing judgment. The prince of this world is already judged. When a soul dies, he's already judged. His soul does not love God. His soul is an enemy of God. It is already judged. And all that happens is the judgment is made complete and manifest. And now the soul goes to the depths of hell where it has already placed itself. And so the soul that does not love God is convicted of sin, justice, and judgment. And up until the day of death, he's given the opportunity to repent. And the soul that does love God is convicted of sin, of justice, and judgment. And up to the day of death, he is to climb the supernatural ladder to get closer and closer to God, to get a greater, greater glory in heaven. And the church, therefore, goes to convict the just of sin, of justice and judgment, and the unjust of sin, justice, and judgment. And who is the one that convicts? He is the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost speaks through the mouth of the priest. He speaks through the mouth of the bishop. 
And now the mouth of the priest and bishop, they are not communicating the divine words. They are not, they are not united to the consoler, to the paraclete. And we have to pray to the church, pray to the Holy Ghost, pray to the Blessed Virgin Mary, that the Holy Ghost once again attach himself to the minister that is in Rome, who is now separated from him, who is called the Holy Father, to those ministers that are in the dioceses who care about their own comfort and their own getting through their own troubles and their own their own status in, the, in this modernist deadly church and not about the kingdom of God and the comfort of the priests who are ministers that don't believe in their ministering, who no longer act as ministers of Christ. They need to be converted. They need to be converted and come to Christ. And they must they get the grace to convict the world of sin, of justice and judgment. The Holy Ghost of Pericles is to speak through these things, through the mouth of the apostles. And then there shall become a victory of Christ in the world, a victory of Christ in souls, and Satan to be completely defeated. In any case, let's persevere in our faith and recognize that sometimes it's good that we don't see Christ every minute. Sometimes it's good to not receive Holy Communion always. Sometimes it's good to not be able to go to the Holy Sacrifice and Mass always. So long as we keep that faith deep in our hearts, and when He walked away from us, He will still come back. He will still be back. He never stays away from us completely. But He wants us to be strong in His apparent absence. And that way we can be true carriers of our Lord Jesus Christ to the ending of times. Blessed God bless you all. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.